Why do so many mechanics sigh or roll their eyes when someone brings in a Pentastar 3.6? It's not a joke, that's a genuine reaction you'll find in repair shops across North America. Despite all the criticism, this engine is still one of the most common V6s on the road. So, if it really has such a bad reputation, why does it remain in production? Well, the answer is more complicated than you might think, and by the end of this, your view of Chrysler's most debated engine might shift. When Chrysler launched the 3.6-liter Pentastar V6 back in 2010, it was marketed as the company's crown jewel, a modern, efficient, do-it-all engine. It was designed to replace six older V6 power plants with a single platform, simplifying production while promising better reliability, performance, and fuel efficiency. With its aluminum block, dual overhead cams, variable valve timing, and output figures above 280 horsepower, it looked like a big leap forward. For a while, it seemed like Chrysler had struck gold. The engine quickly spread across nearly the entire lineup. Dodge Chargers, Chrysler 300s, Jeep Wranglers, Grand Cherokees, even minivans like the Grand Caravan and Pacifica. Millions of them were built in just a few years, and Chrysler was so confident that they even named it after their corporate logo, the Pentastar. But here's the problem with large-scale production. Flaws can't hide. If there's a weak spot in the design, the sheer number of vehicles on the road will expose it quickly. And with the Pentastar, that's exactly what happened. One of the first major issues mechanics noticed was what became known as the tick. By 2012, many shops were dealing with vehicles showing check engine lights, rough idling, cylinder misfires, most often on cylinder two, and a faint ticking sound that grew louder over time. The culprit was a defective left cylinder head. The exhaust valve seats couldn't withstand long-term heat stress, leading to warping and compression loss. The result? Power drops, misfires, and a noisy engine that some mechanics jokingly said sounded like a sewing machine full of rocks. Chrysler eventually acknowledged the flaw, redesigned the head, and extended the warranty on affected vehicles to 10 years or 150,000 miles. But the damage to the engine's reputation was already done. For mechanics, it became one of those repeat repair jobs that were far more time-consuming and frustrating than they looked on paper. The second sore spot was Chrysler's heavy use of plastic components. In theory, plastic made the engine lighter and cheaper to produce, but in practice, it created long-term reliability headaches. The intake manifold, coolant crossover, and especially the oil filter housing were all made of plastic. The oil filter housing in particular became notorious. It was prone to cracking, leaking, and warping under normal heat cycles. A $70 part could end up costing owners hundreds in labor to replace, and in many vehicles, the cramped engine bays made the job even worse. Mechanics started making jokes and memes about it because it was such a common failure. Coolant lines were another weak point, often turning brittle and fracturing with age. Chrysler later switched to stronger aluminum housings and better coolant parts, but by then, the early years had left their mark. Even something as routine as an oil change became a gamble. The Pentastar used a cartridge-style oil filter housed in that fragile plastic assembly. Over-tighten it just a little and you could crack the housing. Use the wrong aftermarket filter and you risk oil pressure loss or even engine damage. Dealerships had the proper tools and OEM parts, but for independent shops or DIY owners, one small mistake could turn into a major problem. Some shops even refused to do Pentastar oil changes unless customers supplied their own filter housing. And this is the key issue with the Pentastar. It wasn't just one flaw, it was a collection of small but widespread problems that added up across millions of vehicles. The engine itself was powerful, efficient, and versatile, but the details, from the cylinder head design to the plastic components, made it a frequent visitor to repair shops and a constant source of frustration for mechanics. One of the biggest mechanical concerns with the early Pentastar engines was the timing chain system. In theory, timing chains are supposed to last the entire life of an engine, but on some first-generation Pentastars, that promise didn't always hold up. If owners weren't disciplined about regular oil changes, the chain and its components could start showing problems. Tensioners occasionally failed, guides wore prematurely, and in severe cases, the chain could stretch or jump teeth. When that happened, the result was often catastrophic. Bent valves, major internal damage, and a repair bill that easily reached into the thousands. The real issue wasn't that the timing chain was poorly engineered, but that the engine demanded strict adherence to maintenance schedules. Miss your oil change intervals, use the wrong oil viscosity, or neglect servicing, and the Pentastar punished you for it. 
Mechanics started jokingly calling it a punishment engine because while it could run smoothly and reliably with proper care, it was completely unforgiving if neglected. By 2016, Chrysler made a serious attempt to address these issues with the introduction of the third generation Pentastar. This wasn't just a minor refresh, it was a full scale upgrade. Engineers added two-stage variable valve lift for better efficiency, improved the timing chain design, and reworked the cylinder heads to eliminate the early valve seat problems. They also introduced stronger aluminum oil filter housings and redesigned coolant components to replace the failure-prone plastic parts. The end result was an engine that ran smoother, quieter, and more efficiently than before. For many owners, the Gen 3 Pentastar finally lived up to Chrysler's original promise. It became a dependable workhorse in vehicles like the Jeep Wrangler and Chrysler Pacifica, with far fewer recurring complaints compared to the earlier models. Still, even though Chrysler managed to fix much of what was wrong, the stigma never truly disappeared. Once an engine earns a reputation for being problematic, it tends to stick in the minds of both mechanics and drivers. When you talk to mechanics today about the Pentastar, you'll hear a wide range of opinions. Some insist it's junk, while others argue that it's actually quite solid if maintained properly. But one theme comes up over and over again. Mechanics are simply tired of working on them. The engine was used in so many different Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram models that even a small percentage of failures turned into a huge number of repair jobs. For example, a 2% defect rate doesn't sound bad, but when you've produced millions of engines, that translates to tens of thousands of vehicles needing repairs. Add in the fact that many components were crammed into tight spaces and surrounded by fragile connectors, and it became the kind of engine that left technicians frustrated after long hours of labor. That's where a lot of the hate comes from. Not necessarily from catastrophic failures, but from the sheer volume of repeat problems and the difficulty of dealing with them. The Toyota V6 has its own flaws. Ford's EcoBoost engines have their share of headaches. But Chrysler, unlike Toyota or Honda, didn't have a strong reputation for bulletproof reliability to shield the Pentastar from criticism. So the Pentastar became an easy target. The real question is whether the 3.6 Pentastar should be considered a failure or just a victim of its own popularity. On paper, it looks like a success story. Since its launch in 2010, over 10 million units have been produced, powering everything from sedans, SUVs, to minivans and muscle cars. It's won awards, helped Chrysler meet emissions and fuel economy targets, and remains in production today. Later versions, especially the Gen 3, have proven themselves as reliable, capable, and relatively efficient V6 engines. That kind of longevity usually signals success, not failure. The problem lies in those first few years. The cylinder head ticking, brittle plastic parts, timing chain complaints, and fragile oil filter housing left a lasting impression on both owners and mechanics. These weren't total engine failures, but they were persistent and frustrating problems that kept showing up again and again. And when you see the same issues walk into your repair shop every week, it doesn't take long before you develop a dislike for the engine itself. That's the Pentastar's true legacy. Not a disaster, but not greatness either. It's an engine that annoyed mechanics and owners more than it amazed them. It didn't explode in spectacular fashion, but instead chipped away at patience with a steady stream of leaks, ticks, and rattles. For some mechanics, that makes it one of the most hated engines of the modern era. For others, it's just another modern power plant with quirks that become more noticeable simply because so many of them were built. Love it or hate it, the Pentastar 3.6 isn't going away anytime soon, and its reputation will probably always remain split between defenders and critics.